group is a group of charities and social enterprises. And our mission is to change the world, to make it a better place. So a um, small mission. Then. A small mission, yeah. <laughs> um, when I used to say that at conferences, people used to laugh. Mm. You know, there was a little snigger around the conference. Um, but uh, then Barack Obama started saying it. I think he copied me. Oh, you, you were there first. I was there first. Yes. And uh, now no one laughs when you say it. You they say, do... yes, we can as well. Yeah, uh, no. <laughs> but they do then think that I've copied Barack Obama, so I'm going to have to drop it a bit, I okay. think, maybe. But um, I think it is really important because people think that they can't change anything. Mm. And uh, I think things like the anti-apartheid movement and you know, the whole um, environmental campaigns have shown that individuals, if they make choices mm. for themselves, can have big impact. Mm. And it's about everybody making positive choices about what they mm. want in life. I think somebody once said that, um, um, you know, can individuals, they were asked, can individuals make a change or make a difference? And the reply was that, well, that's the only way it's ever been. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think the really sad thing is that most of the people we work with, you know, who are you know, down on their uppers, basically, you know, they're having a really bad time in life. Mm. Um, they don't feel that they can change anything or control anything about their lives. They, mm. You know, they can't control what they're going to eat or where they're going to sleep mm. or, mm. you know, what's going to happen to them. And rebuilding that belief in themselves and their own power to control their own mm. lives is just a little step in that. So who are we talking about, Faye? What sort of people are we talking about here who, who you're helping? Okay, well, we work with all the people who don't get a good deal from kind of mainstream services. So generally people with drug addictions, mental health needs, families living in poverty, migrant communities, um, people who are homeless. Generally people who have very chaotic lifestyles or have fallen on hard times who need a bit of a hand up. Not a hand up. Uh, yeah, a hand up a to help themselves. Hand, yes. A helping hand. So um, it's really what we try and do is give them chances to turn their lives around mm. um we don't give charity in the sense that we don't just give out handouts mm. what we do is we try to create them an opportunity where they can deliver something so it might be selling the big issue it might okay. be about helping them get into employment it might be about training them so it's it might about be helping about them help themselves helping them help yes. themselves yeah absolutely the, i was reading your your blog um and there was a young man who found that he <clears throat> he had a talent for art and I think you suggested to him that he should maybe teach an art class oh, yes. in the place where he was. You were is helping this on him. Uh, make justice yes, work. Yeah. Yes, yes. But he said that he didn't think he was good enough. Yeah. But you, and you interpreted that that he didn't think he was good enough as a person, as opposed to good enough at art. Yeah. So it's about self belief. We see a lot of that. Is that um, and in fact, people are quite shocked if you say to them, "Why don't you do something or lead something or mm. help others?" Because. I think the trouble with society today is quite often if you are at the bottom of the pile, so mm. to speak, is that people that you just become used to people doing things to you and giving things to you. And, you know, you speak to some people and they'll tell you the whole life history, things that you just wouldn't go and, and tell other people. But they're so used to just having to go in a room and tell complete strangers, most intimate things mm. that all of those kind of that self-respect and those boundaries have been lost. Yes. And along with it also is that um, belief that um, they can't they haven't got anything to contribute mm. and so we really like this idea of this kind of change exchange you know we'll give something but you have to you know what have you got what are mm. your skills mm. what are your assets what are you giving back sure tell me more about these these community centers that you've set up um well we started just with one that was our first thing we ever did in 1991 so it's going way back and um, it was in Hume at the time when, um, you know, before it was regenerated and um, Gunchester and all of that. And um, the area had very uh, poor housing and it, it was run by the council and it had a lot of void. So what happened is that if you were in hospital or prison or, you know, you had a family breakdown or something and you needed a house quickly, you would, mm. you'd end up there because mm. um, it had very easily accessible housing. So you had a concentration of people with quite high levels of need. And I think the community got to the point where it felt like it was fed up of waiting for the public sector to come and sort itself out and mm. come and, and sort, help them sort the area out. So um, we started developing kind of self-help responses, community groups and so on. And we had this idea that what we wanted to do was create a community centre which would be about self-help. And everyone said to us, oh, no one will come, you know, because everyone's moving out of the area. And year on year, the numbers of people attending the centre grew and grew, despite the fact that, you know, we were surrounded by bulldozers and fences. And, you know, I mean, it was like living in Beirut, I think, mm. at one point. Um, but um, numbers grew and people kept coming. And then services, statutory public sector services started saying to us, well, 
if all these people are coming to you, we can't get them to come to us, so can we come and work in your building? So we developed this kind of concept of multi-agency buildings where kind of community groups, voluntary sector, third sector and statutory agencies work together, but all within an ethos of self-help. So what was stopping people coming to those other places? What, what was putting them off? Well, you know, we are talking 20 odd years ago now, so it's not as bad as it was mm. then, but, you know... Um, I remember we um, the social services building, just to get into the social services building, you'd, you'd go through a gate and you'd come to a door and you'd press a button mm. and you'd go in a cubby hole and then you'd speak in an intercom and then you'd go through to the next, well, it was the reception, but it had a reception desk and two locked doors and, you know, basically the whole setup was that you're going to be a problem and it's about mm. keeping you out and controlling you and managing you. Um, and when we did uh, our second centre, we moved the... Um, mental health social work team in from this building into our building and we had like hotel reception low desks mm. employed local people so it felt like you know somewhere you wanted to go mm. um and obviously we had security but it was very um discreet security yes. and it was about how people behaved and initially the social workers were like oh we can't we can't work in you know where's the security and we were going you know it's about how you treat people when they walk in the mm, door mm. um and we've had in um i think we've had that contract now for about 12 years of mm. uh, delivering that center and in that time i think we've had um the police in once you know yeah. it, it's you know it is about treating people with respect mm. do you think a lot of the problem um is that we try as a society to uh, control people and put them into little boxes so that they fit our way of seeing the world rather than allowing them to express themselves and, and be themselves or be a better version of themselves? Uh, I think that's the consequence of it. Mm. I think that why it happens is because um, we think, oh, we've got someone here, they've got a mental health problem, we need a mental health service. Mm. They don't think actually they're a mother, you know, they, they want some education or training or they want to get a job or you know they've got low self-esteem mm. or something they think oh they've got a mental health problem you know yes. we ought to treat that so we Put need a mental health box. person yeah yes. and uh, or we think oh um an employment service that's over here and i think um successive governments have tried to say okay let's break down these silos um uh, but the problem is that you know they we don't have services that are like about the whole person mm. and say right okay what does this person want mm. it's about um, understanding them better in their situation absolutely better before absolutely implanting a solution on them yeah. mm. but it's also that um they're needy you know it is only seeing their needs not yes. seeing their contribution yes yes can you, I, i'm interested in what we might call the backstory why do you do this i don't know <laughs> <laughs> I ask myself every day. did it what well, i'm interested to know what the motivation for doing this is why did you set this up in the first place was it, it 1992 uh, 1991 yes, 91 yeah, yes yeah. Well, we became a group in 2002, mm -hmm. but uh, we started in 91 with the first centre. Um, I think um, I, I was very, always brought up in a very a household which always discussed social issues mm. all the time. And, um, you know, from early years, we were, you know, m my granddad was a trade unionist and my uncle was, and we were always involved in those kind of mm. debates around social justice and what was right. Um, and um, so I think that's kind of a bit inbred in you, isn't it? Mm. You've kind of grown up with that. Um, but I think um, seeing some of those issues for myself, you know, um, having a partner with mental health needs and seeing how she was treated, particularly as a black woman, mm. um, using some of the services as a lesbian, as, you know, just trying to have a baby mm. within a, a statutory sector setting where I was told my partner couldn't come to a scan with me because she was female. Right. Um, where my doctor wouldn't discuss... Um, my health issues with me because I, she was a she with with her present yes because they were personal um you know those kind of things and and looking at living I actually lived in Hume at the time mm. and lived with people who had um friends who had children who were, who were drug users seeing how um they were uh, treated or not treated mm. what services they were able to get um I think having that very strong personal experience makes you think god it's got to be better than this yes and i was always brought up with this thing that you could you could make things different yes. you could always change things and i had some great um, work experiences where you know i was given the opportunity to have a go at changing something i remember one of my first jobs for the local authority i worked for them for a couple of years um was um i had to go to tenants and explain to them 
what compensation payments they were getting mm. for um, moving house. And so there was people living, you know, on very low incomes and they were having to be moved because of some regeneration. And they were getting pitiful amounts, you know, for replacing carpets and, you know, all their removals and everything. And I had to go and explain it to them. And not only was it a pitiful amount, but it was bureaucracy gone mad. Yes. And um, I remember going to my boss and saying, you know, this can't be right. And I found out that there were five different departments all involved in signing off these measly payments. I mean, it must cost more to administer it than yes, actually do it. the system costs more, yes. Um, and they agreed that I could go away and come up with a different way of doing it. Mm. So I did this whole piece of work and, and uh, re-engineered the way that the compensation payments would be made. It didn't make any difference to the tenants except for that it was a simpler process and yes. it was quicker. And we cut out about six months. Mm. Um, so they weren't living six months without a carpet on their floor. But it made the it made the process simple, it made it quicker, and it saved money. Yes. And I thought, you know, that kind of experience early on in your kind of career mm. makes you realise that bureaucracies can change, yes. and you can create organisations that don't have to be bureaucracies. Yes, yes, yes. Now tell us about the big issue. How did that idea come about? Well, I didn't set the big issue up. So uh, Anne McNamara and Ruth Turner set it up in um, Manchester mm. in uh, 1992, and. Um, they um, basically were inspirational young women working in Manchester, wanting to do something around homelessness and uh, working um, with um, some of the street outreach um, uh, services that were going at mm. the time. And John Bird had set up the big issue in London. And um, so they initially um, asked him if they could use the big issue and distribute that here. And then we put in a Manchester supplement, a one page supplement. Um, and then it kind of grew from there so we now have our own editorial team we cover mm. the whole of the north of England um, and um, it's, a, it's a fantastic opportunity for people to get structure in their lives I mean we, we've had a, a lot of criticism over the years for lots of different things but I think unless you can talk to some of the vendors and see how the fact that they've got something to get up for in the morning and come into office and they budget they manage their time mm. um, and um, it really makes a big difference to their confidence, their mm. interaction with people. Can you give us some figures about you know the numbers of people involved and, and okay. what sort of monies are raised? Yeah, we have um, about 300 vendors at any one time across the north of England. Mm. Um, and, and that's stretching from where to where? Liverpool to Hull. Okay. Yeah. Um, bits of it are done by other regions, so um, say... Um, uh, Newcastle is done mm. by uh, the London big issue so um, but uh, we do that kind of stretch across there and we do up to Carlisle mm. um, so um, yeah about 300 vendors at any one time basically they buy the big issue for a pound and then they sell it on the street for two pounds okay. so they keep a pound of everything that they sell mm. um, and um, in any one year we can have up to a thousand people come through the big issue mm. fantastic yeah, it is. It's great. <laughs> now, can you? Uh, w one of the things we love to hear about in in Mojo Life is uh, success stories. Yeah. About somebody who's come in in a state in a bad place and has gone out better. Can you think of one? Um, yeah, I can think of millions. Putting you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was. Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you a bit of a sad story. I have, I have a happy ending, not particularly for this lady, but one of our first ever clients was a woman who um, uh, was a heroin user and uh, she had a child who was two. And um, we thought we'd done a fantastic job with her because 20 years ago it was quite hard to get on a methadone maintenance script and uh, come off heroin. And she, um, we helped to get access to a script. We helped to get rehoused with her daughter away from her social network, which was all around drug using. And she used to pop in and see us every couple of weeks and, you know, things seemed to be going well. Um, and then um, we had this horrible moment when um, we heard that her daughter had actually drank the methadone and methadone is very poisonous mm. and died. Oh, and um, uh, her mother got um, arrested for manslaughter. So not only had she lost her child mm. and would obviously feel guilty about that for the rest of her life, but also um, was arrested for manslaughter. And at that point, we thought, God, we've got to be able to do better than this. You know, mm. it's that that realisation that, you know, collectively we'd failed. Mm. Um, we'd failed that child as well as that mother. Um, and so we spent quite a long time then looking at uh, getting agencies together and thinking about how we can improve services for women 
um, who were par- well parents who were drug users and their children. A lot of the people that we see, their parents are drug users. Mm. Um, they're on that cycle. Um, and we wanted to see how we could break that cycle. And we did focus groups with parents and we designed a service which was around... Um, helping parents who'd had a detox then rebuild their family lives together. Because what these focus groups were saying is that um, uh, if you've been using drugs since you were 13, you're suddenly 26, you get pregnant, you think, right, I've got to change my life now, I've got to sort it out. Uh, You manage to detox, you have this baby, and suddenly you've got, for the first time, all of your emotions hitting you. Mm. you don't know what to do with them. You haven't done that normal maturing stage because mm. ma- most of your emotions have been masked over that period by yes. your drug use. Um, you haven't developed the skills that normally people would develop. And you have a child, which is the hardest job in history. Everyone knows <laughs> parenting <laughs> is a tough. Yes. Um, and um, so suddenly you have all that hit you. And what they wanted was someone just to help them in that period. Mm. Um, so it didn't all get too much and they go, I can't do it, I'm crap. It reinforces mm. their, you know, I think... You have to have good self-esteem to be a parent, don't you? You know, you have to be able to really take the knocks. Yes. And if you haven't, you know, you're, you, it's easy to give up. And yes. So, so we developed this supported housing scheme, uh, developed on this model. And um, one of the women who came and worked on it um, came and her daughter wrote this fantastic poem, which was around um, what it felt like trying to do your homework. Uh, this was before her, her mother came off drugs and being constantly worried about her mother and not knowing what state her mother would be in and how lonely it felt and so on. Um, and then what it was like to feel like in, living in a safe environment and feeling some stability for the first time in her life. And her mother um, actually um, succeeded at, at, wor- at working through developing her family, yeah. getting her family back together again and um, moved into independent accommodation and started training as a nurse and is now um, a, 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 you know, a trainee nurse. Gosh. And you just think, how fantastic is mm. that? Not only has this woman, and I think people who can overcome really big barriers mm. like that, they've got to be stronger than anyone else. They're best placed in a way because they Absolutely. know what it's like to be in the shoes of the people they're helping. Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, you know, I don't know anyone who, you know, people who smoke, I don't smoke myself, but people who smoke, you, you see them really struggling with that addiction. Mm. Well, times that by however many hundred to get a, an addiction like heroin yes. or crack or yes. something else and be able to move off that mm. Um, mm. and then maintain that and, you know, completely turn your life mm. around. Mm. Fantastic. Mm. I think we, we see this a lot with speakers as well, which we enjoy listening to. It's their authentic journey that they've been yeah. on. We want to hear their struggle. Yeah. You know, what did you do when things weren't going very well? Because that it resonates with people. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. So, just finally, is there um, is there a, a, a kind of an ambition for you now? What would you like to achieve in the work that you do now that's not currently being done? Oh God, millions! Yeah, loads. Um, I'd like uh, I'd like us to grow. I think you know at the size we're at now. You know, um, we're kind of. Um, uh, middle of the middle of the road and there's so many more people out there that we could be helping and um, so I'd, I'd really like us to grow in particular I'd like us to grow more of our uh, supported housing and our primary care because we deliver this great um, uh, primary care service mm. GP nurses with social work input for people with complex needs mm. so you know I was talking about people who have more than one issue mm. and they want to try and deal, deal with them you know, having um, those kind of centres more across the north, that's what I'd like to see more of those, Mm. so that people are able to access a really good quality service um, and, uh, and, um, uh, you know, uh, deal with all of their issues, but also contribute to to other people and Mm. so on. But I think, um, you know, we're in tough times, aren't we? And um, the reality is, I think, the biggest thing I think I'd like to achieve is developing some of the self-reliance and um, uh, capacity within communities to mm. really, you know, make sure they get through this in a positive way. Because I think we get divisions and uh, people start fighting amongst themselves. Mm. We have a, a, a large Roma community now in, in the north of England, well, in England as a whole. And... Um, you know, we've already seen some of this where people start blaming other people. There was news this morning about it's Eastern European people who are coming over here stopping all our young people getting jobs. Yeah. I think, um, you know, if we can 
turn that around and really get communities supporting each other and really being entrepreneurial mm. um, to get out the other side of where we are. That, yes. That's a big ambition. And is there one final message for the, uh, the audience listening to this? How, how can they help you on your mission? Um, I think if, if everybody thought that they could change the world, it would be a better place. Mm. You know, let's start there. Start with something simple. Um, and I remember one of my uh, nursery managers, you know, because we run day nurseries, came in and said to me, that, she told me this story about how um, the, um, one, some of the parents started complaining because we were going to use a mental health charity to provide the food for the, um, for the kids. And I was really worried when she told me this because I thought, oh my God, you know, she's going to say we can't use that mental health charity, the parents don't like it and we need their income and uh, blah, blah, blah. And um, I was really worried. And, and she said, no, no, I, I got the parents in the office and I said to them, you do know you're discriminating, don't you? And that this service is, you know, checked by environmental health. It's, you know, it's as safe as any other service. And, you know, don't you think that that's wrong? And the, the parent was actually a social worker, mm. so it made it even more shocking. Um, but I was really proud of her because I thought, you know, she'd made a difference. Mm. She'd, by sticking to her values, she challenged someone's... And this person was mortified because mm. they hadn't realised they'd done it. Yes. We all discriminate all the time and it needs people to stand up and point it out to us yes. and us to be big enough to take it and mm. go, yeah, I'm, you're right, I've got to change that attitude. Mm. And um, if every single person challenged something that they thought wasn't right in a nice way mm. and we were all big enough to go, yeah, okay, good point, then I think we'd have a better world. Mm. Fantastic. Faith Selman, thank you very much. Thank you.